Good morning, big girls. For some of you, that makes you uncomfortable. Perfect setting because this video is all about players in fantasy football that make me really uncomfortable drafting them this year, okay? They're not dudes that I'm just plainly avoiding. Like, there's not a uh, complete fade on these guys. I'm not putting out a hit on their head. You know, there's no bounty on these guys. But I just find myself, I get a little bit of the shakes when their name's the top of the ADP and I have to click draft on them. So I'm going to talk through five players that make me really uncomfortable drafting this year. I'm going to I'm going to talk through why they make me uncomfortable, but also the upside or the positives of them. So if they fall to me at value, you know, if I want to diversify the revenue a little bit and sprinkle a little bit here, a little bit there, just to get them on my teams in case I'm wrong, very rarely, but every once in a while, uh, I will draft them. Okay. So again, they're not on, they're not on the bounty list and they're on the fade list, but these are five guys that I'm extremely uncomfortable drafting. The only way to be comfortable watching a video is by tucking your shirt in. First guy up on this list is Mr. Stefan Diggs, the new wide receiver out here in Houston. You know, it's not a hot take, but just the competition for touches in Houston this year is insane between Nico Collins, who just got the bag, Tank Dell, who's coming off of an explosive rookie year, Dalton Schultz, and then they just gave Joe Mixon some money to take a bunch of those early down touches. Okay, so you have a ton of really talented dudes that all are going to need to touch the ball. will all probably cannibalize each other to some degree or another. Now, the reason Stefan Diggs scares me in particular, like I'll still draft Nico Collins. I'll still draft Tank. Dell. I'm pretty much open to drafting all of these guys where they're going. But Diggs, without a doubt, makes me the most uncomfortable. He's the old dude. He's me at a high school party. Like, what are you doing here? I don't want to talk to you. I don't really want to be around you. Okay. It's no surprise we are on the back half of, of Stefan Diggs' career. I think it's probably slapping us in the face and we are choosing to uh, ignore it. I want to look at Matt Harmon's RP profile of Stefan Diggs. It's it's not bad whatsoever, right? Man, zone, press. He's all 75th, 70th in that range in terms of like percentile success rate. However, relative to where Diggs had been for the last you know half decade, he was a, a dude who was setting records in reception perception, a dude who was separating via man at like a 98th percentile. Some of, I actually think he scored the single best uh, man success percentile season of all time in, in RP. So I think we're starting to see a little bit of the decline and this, and this tends to happen. All right. Now this is a direct quote from the RP profile, the downfield routes are the first area. The eyes should go on Dix's route chart. This man has routinely cleared the NFL average success rate on every single route type. The biggest area of the decline was in the downfield game, where his nine corner and dig route success rate sunk below the NFL average, while his post route score just clung to the average range. So his explosiveness down the field, and that's typically what happens when receivers age, is their downfield playmaking ability starts to decline a little bit. They're not fast enough or explosive enough to separate on that second gear. And, uh, and this seems to be happening to Stefan Diggs. And my issue really is with Diggs that makes me uncomfortable is like Nico isn't going that much higher. And the re success rates plus his production last year are just like miles above Stefan Diggs at this point in their respective careers. And Diggs is also going like two rounds higher than Tank Dell when I feel like Tank Dell just in terms of like a pure pound for bound click for click receiver is is almost as good as probably Diggs is and will be over the next you know two years. So ultimately, Diggs is like the worst value here to me, and it makes it hard to invest in when he's on the clock because you're like, oh, I'll just get Tank later. I'll get Dalton Schultz. I'll get a different piece of this offense. It's like it's like buying a four-piece McNugget for a dollar when you can get a 10-piece for $2. You know, it, it's, it's enough to make you reconsider. Now, I will say, based on the success rates and the, and the RP profile, it's a little bit similar to Keenan Allen last year, right? After being in the 95th percentile uh, success rate versus all these types of coverages for a very, very long time. He had a little bit of a fall off coming into last year where he ended up being around where Diggs was, where, you know, 75th percentile, 65th percentile, like still good, still a, uh, an above average receiver, but not elite anymore. And you're like, OK, the decline is is starting. And then Keenan Allen ended up having, you know, like the best year of his career statistically. And I'm sure some of that had to do with Eckler's injury and nosedive and Mike Williams's injury. But nonetheless, like Diggs's success rate is not in the complete no fly zone. There's just very clear signs to me that uh, there are just red flags. There's so much competition. There may be a downfall in his talent. And even if there isn't a major downfall in his talent, the concern for touches around him makes me feel like his his ceiling could be very, very capped in this 
offense. Now, switching gears to player number two, we have a veteran wide receiver in Diggs. We have a young wide receiver in Jackson Smith and Jigba out there in Seattle. Now, he was clearly the number three on Seattle last year. There was almost nothing about his limited you know, underlying metrics that felt very promising from last year. Everyone wanted to talk about how, oh, yeah, for without a doubt, Tyler Lockett's going to fall off and JSN will be the guy over the second half of the year. He's the best prospect in his class. He's the best prospect since Jamar Chase. All that bullshit ends up going pick 2021 like the NFL said differently. And I think a lot of last year kind of played out that way. Yards per out run, he's outside of the top 60 formation adjusted yards per out run. He's 58th yards per target, yards per reception, yards per team pass attempt. Like it's all it's all pretty bad. I know you could see target separation was number six, but average cushion was number nine. And I think a lot of that just has to do with being in the slot. The cornerbacks play off of you. So that's just not a good metric, in my opinion. So continuing down the JSN slander, like I'm, I'm also just not sold that Tyler Lockett is just going to vanish like the way he plays. He just falls. He just catches and flops, catches and flops, catches and flops. The man doesn't get hurt. So he could play for a long time. And obviously, DK Metcalf is not going anywhere. So JSN, obviously, like a stellar prospect just from an analytics point of view and Obviously, the offense overall, Seattle took a step back last year. They weren't great. All that stuff kind of makes me nervous, right? And here's a tweet from uh, Hayden Winks, who obviously works at Underdog, makes great content over there on their YouTube channel. The eight players whose underdog ADPs are more than 75 spots earlier than their overall finish in fantasy points over replacement per game last year. Jameson Williams, Kyle Pitts, Dalton Kincaid, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, number fourth on that list. Jameson Williams, Kyle Pitts, Don Kincaid. And then you see number four on that list is Jackson Smith in Jigba. So it's one of those like picks, you know, similar to Jameson Williams, similar to Kyle Pitts, similar to Kincaid, similar to Garrett Wilson. Like they're coming off of fine years, but we're projecting them to, to take this elite step up there, man. And that is what should make you nervous. And that's what makes me nervous. Now, I, I think there are definitely, you know, positives to look out for when it comes to JSN. Sometimes rookies just take a minute to get situated. Now you have Shane Waldron swapping out for Ryan Grubb, the former OC from Washington, who is coming out of that Michael Penix, but more importantly, Roma Dunze, Jalen McMillan, Jalen Polk offense, where he used three wide receiver sets to ah, perfection. Last year, the Seattle Seahawks used three wide receiver sets 62% of the time. Last year, Washington used three wide receiver sets under Ryan Grubb 79% of the time. Now, obviously, it's not just tit for tat. We're not just transferring over the exact specifications and percentages and stuff from college over to the NFL, but it is a good sign, okay? So if there's anyone that knows how to use three wide receiver sets to a, you know, to the T, it is Mr. Ryan Grubb out there in Seattle. All right, so JSN just scares me. We just, overall, we just don't actually know how good he is as an NFL player. We don't know if Tyler Lockett's going to fall off. We don't know if he's going to be the number three. We don't know if Geno Smith is going to play terribly we don't know if this passing offense is going to be any good so i am a little bit nervous about jsn despite the projections going into it as hayden winks tweet kind of you know persuaded to and on that note mr kyle pitts was atop that list and he is number three on this list and i get it yes kyle pitts came in at age like 14 years old put up a thousand yards as a rookie this is something that i've echoed year after year after year he basically that rookie year he had three big games he had three big games versus three of the worst pass defenses in the NFL at that at that time and those three games accounted for like 40 percent of his overall counting stats on that entire year and I do wonder this I do wonder this I don't know that I've really ever heard this question asked before and I started to ask myself a little bit recently I, I genuinely wonder like if Pitts didn't hit a thousand yards his rookie year and I'm talking about like he hit 992 or 986 would we be talking about him the same? Because that's the easiest stat in the world to just continuously cling on to over and over and over again. 1,000 yards a rookie. 1,000 yards a rookie. No one does that. 1,000 yards a rookie. In 2021, that was the first year that the NFL played 17 games, all right? And Pitts played all 17 games. So he likely is not hitting that 1,000-yard mark. And we might be looking at him differently and clinging on to him differently if he played the 16 games like everybody before him and he finished with 986, all right? I'm pessimistic. Can you can you hear the Falcons fan in me Yet. All right. Good tweet from Mr. Pat Doherty, Roto Pat over there. Good follow. The environment was the environment. And he said he wasn't the same after his 2022 MCL injury. But Kyle Pitts was 33rd in tight end open score last season, 41st in average tight end yards after catch and 16th in yards per route run. He is on the spot. And I think by the spot, he just means the hot seats. Like I said, as a Falcons fan, I am skeptical. All right. We are we are the paper champs right now. Our win total is at like 11, despite despite being a completely new 
everything. New offense, new coaching staff, new quarterback, who is the opposite of new, coming off of a an Achilles tear uh, at 36 years old. And you have three hypothetical super weapons in this offense with Kyle Pitts, Drake London, and Bijan Robinson, which, if we're being honest, we have not seen any of them hit any real ceiling at the NFL level yet. So with all that being said, again, I, I feel like I need to remind you, y'all, because y'all are so fucking sensitive that – these are not dudes that I'm just completely fading. They're just dudes that get me really, really nervous to draft them. And I'm trying to I'm trying to vent about, I'm trying to get emotional about why that is the case for them. None of these guys are easy smashes for me when they are on the clock. OK, so on the flip side with Pitts, uh, his targets the last couple of years, of course, have been atrocious because the quarterback play has been atrocious. His catchable target rate has ranked outside of the top 35 tight ends at the, at the position in both 2023 and 2022. This guy. This guy, Kyle Pitts, has been number one amongst tight ends in unrealized air yards in each of the last two seasons, okay? That means he is getting a ton of air yards, a ton of deep attempts, a ton of shots down the field to him, literally number one amongst the position, and they are unrealized, meaning they go uncaught. So maybe they were drops, but more likely bad targets, more likely low quality targets. So you could just see in that stat how much opportunity is being left on the field. But there's always going to be the lingering, like, are we sure that Pitts is actually just as good as advertised? Mix in with the actual truth that the quarterback play has been abysmal for multiple years in a row. So there are definitely two sides to the story. There's no right. There's no wrong. There are multiple things at play here that both can be true. I will say that the Atlanta offense for sure is one of the most interesting storylines going into this year. Like Kirk realistically does not discriminate by position. The most talented dudes just get fed in the offenses that he ends up leading, whether it is Justin Jefferson or Hawkinson or Adam Thielen or Stefan Diggs, little chart I put together just looking at tight ends since Kirk Cousins has been the starting quarterback. And when he has a very talented tight end, Jordan Reed back in the day, TJ Hawkinson the last couple of years, the target numbers are certainly there. All right, Jordan Reed going back to 2015, 2016, 8.1 targets per game, 7.4 targets per game. The last couple of years, TJ Hawkinson, just the games in Minnesota. They played with Kirk 11.5 targets per game last year, 8.6 the year before. So, like, the opportunity will be there if Kyle Pitts is who we think he is. But Drake London might be who we think he is. Bijan Robinson might be who we think he is. All right. There's a lot of moving parts that make me very insecure about having Kyle Pitts as my starting tight end in fantasy football. Plus, if you have rostered him for any amount of time over the last couple of years, you don't need me to explain to you why he makes us uncomfortable as fantasy players. All right. Let's move on to running back number one on this list, but player number four on this list. And I just want to throw a quick uh, plug in here that if you are new to the channel, I would love for y'all to subscribe. We're putting out videos like this pretty much six days a week now that July is about to pop up. I will start streaming on Saturdays as well. We'll be doing uh, underdog drafts, best ball drafts. I know uh, a lot of y'all been asking me if we will be starting those up. So yes, subscribe to the channel, put that little notification bell on so that when I go live on Saturday, probably around 1 p.m., 2 p.m. Eastern time, something in that in that gist, in that area, uh, you can jump in and ask me any questions that you might have for the upcoming season, all right? But videos pretty much every single day going forward. Subscribe, hit the button that looks like this while you are down there. And let's talk about Aaron Jones, the Minnesota newly signed running back. I'm, I'm big nervous about a, about a timeshare in that backfield between he and Ty Chandler. I think Ty Chandler is going to get significant enough work that it's going to lead to a lack of like ceiling overall for Aaron Jones. I'm also not sure like how effective this run game could be in Minnesota. They're not, they don't have like a lot of great infrastructure there to make the run game go. Last year, they were 25th in EPA per rush play, okay? Aaron Jones has also missed significant time with injuries in his career. Uh, I, I think he'll be good in full PPR leagues, but if it's not full PPR, like we're drafting on underdog, that's half PPR. It's very touchdown dependent. I really have a hard time banking on him being more than anything, than, more than like a low-end RB2 uh, in RB3. The situation out there as it relates to like the quarterback's scares me as well. Like, how successfully can you run an offense through Sam Darnold or J.J. McCarthy? Seems like Sam Darnold's going to get the first crack at it, but, like, people are on crack and think Sam Darnold's, like, this fucking above-average quarterback when he's shown us, like, eight years of sample size of not being that. So I don't know how this offense is going to run through either a proven not-to-be-good veteran quarterback or an unproven rookie quarterback, all right? So that, 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 that scares me. And all that was negative. Now, Aaron Jones has been one of the coolest NFL players over the last you know, six, seven years. He has been one of the swaggiest. He's been one of the, the the most fun players to roster if you have rostered him in fantasy during his 
good years, okay? Last year, week one, he went fucking crazy. 125 yards from scrimmage, two touchdowns. He missed a lot of time after that with injuries that lingered. So you kind of got fucked if you drafted Aaron Jones after week one. But when he returned, I need people to hear just how good he was down the stretch over their last five games. So from week 16 through the divisional round, here are Aaron Jones's fucking numbers. Week 16, 24 opportunities, 135 yards from scrimmage, six yards per carry. Week 17, 21 opportunities, 130 yards from scrimmage, six yards per carry. Week 18, 27 opportunities, 141 yards from scrimmage, five yards per carry. Wild card round, 22 opportunities, 131 yards from scrimmage, three touchdowns, 5.6 yards per carry. Divisional round, 24 opportunities, 116 yards from scrimmage. Season ended there. But you're talking about that five-game stretch where he didn't see fewer than 21 opportunities in any game, and his worst game was 116 yards from scrimmage. It, 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 it is possible that Aaron Jones is simply still him. He is still him, okay? He is as fun of a back as, as you're going to find in the NFL, but I'm just more worried about that situation and that offense, okay? So all of it is possible, all the above, but it's all what makes me hesitant to draft him because here here is my uh, concern is that we're in like week seven and this offense is just having a lot of trouble moving the chains and they're putting up, you know, they're, they're getting beat continuously like 24 to 17, 24 to 16, whatever the case may be. Uh, they're not moving the ball very well, and Ty Chandler's getting a little bit more work than we anticipated. You're looking at Aaron Jones being like the heart of every sit-start question of like Aaron Jones or fucking Antonio Gibson or some bullshit like that, and that makes me a little bit nervous. And staying in Minnesota for player number five, we have Mr. Jordan Addison, okay? Sophomore, coming off a monster, monster rookie year, and it's a lot of the same sentiment for Jones. Again, I'm just unsure about this offense, um, especially the quarterback situation, okay? Addison went for 900 yards and 10 touchdowns as a rookie. But he also had Kirk Cousins just fucking slinging that thing last year, right? So we cannot underrate that. And on top of that, there was a bunch of missed time from both Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson. So that'll always boost, you know, statistics when you're kind of force-fed a little bit more volume than we can anticipate going forward, although TJ Hawkinson could miss a lot of time, all right? The, the other thing that makes me a little bit nervous, he did get there with the yardage, right? He had 900 yards, which is a, a really, really good rookie season, so it's not like Jahan Dotson, where he had, I don't know, 500, 600 yards and like eight or nine touchdowns, which boosts his value in our mind. Ten touchdowns are fluky, okay? That, that ain't going to repeat itself, because if you really try to project out this passing offense, like this team probably projects for like 23 passing touchdowns on the year. Uh, 10 of them ain't going to Jordan Addison, all right? And the last thing that I think is is kind of uh, crucial to point out here, again, going back to Matt Harmon's RP, great resource, again, receptionperception.com. If you're not already a member, highly suggest you sign up. He didn't perform well. He was in the 60th percentile for zone coverage, but 12th against press, 29th against man. That's not surprising given uh, he was never good against press. He is a slender like body okay so he has trouble getting off the line trouble getting off of uh physical coverage and he kind of made a, a a living off of big plays last year okay so he was tied for the third most touchdowns of 40 plus yards only Tyreek Hill and George Pickens had more 40 plus yard touchdowns than Jordan Addison last year okay all I have to say that that is for sure part of Addison's game uh 910 as a rookie is really fucking impressive no matter how you want to contextualize it he was a really cool college player I think he showed a lot on film in college he's a downfield threat so those games are just going to happen and I think the other thing to just like consider here too while I'm down on him and I'm scared about the situation and I'm uncomfortable drafting him where he's going I think it's also reasonable to say like he's just a fucking sophomore and he is outside of Justin Jefferson meaning the coverage will never shift towards him uh, TJ Hawkinson is probably going to miss a significant chunk of the year. So this is going to be a relatively condensed offense. So even if it's not a high volume passing offense that doesn't see a ton of efficiency, uh, they're probably going to be trailing a decent amount in that division and have to throw the ball a little bit. And it'll probably go to Jefferson. It'll probably go to Addison over and over and over and over and over again. So the upside case is there. I don't want to fade him again into oblivion, but I am uncomfortable drafting Mr. Addison, even off of the big rookie year. So that's going to do it for today. I will be back tomorrow with another video like this individual. I think the schedule pretty much going forward will be uh, a group podcast between myself, Adam and Andrew every Monday, Thursday. You'll have an individual video just like this every Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and then my underdog streams on Saturday. All right. So if you enjoyed today's video, make sure you go put the D and subscribe 
hit the button that looks like this while you're down there. I love y'all and I'll see you tomorrow.